Doris is uh, disenchanted with her life. I think she's found herself at, at, I'm 42, so I assume she's 42. Doris has found herself at 42, not being any really farther ahead than she was when she was 22, in the same town. Um, I think she always, she comes from a large Italian family. I think she always hoped to like kind of disassociate herself a little bit farther from that. And she's found herself, married, she's married to Egg Crane, the barber, who works in the family business. Her father was a barber, her brother's a barber. And I think that the glamour of her life is working in this department store, even though she is an accountant. It's the glamour of the town comes out of that store. And so her relationship with the the uh, owner's husband, Big Dave, who she's, she's having an affair with her boss, Big Dave, I think that it just, it's, it's the one big moment of her life. With Billy Bob, it's been extraordinary to watch him because his character, Ed Crane, is narrating the film. So, in fact, the whole film is going to have a voiceover, his voiceover telling the story. He's telling the story of the film. And it's really from his perspective. And the rest of us are kind of like players in his own black and white movie. And I, I, I am constantly in awe of how he, is, he manages to, because when he's on, on screen, he barely says a word. He, he breathes. He, he's breathing and smoking. That's what he does on screen. But within that, the range he's created is extraordinary. There's no way you could see this movie in color. There's no way that you would want to see this movie in color. This film, it, the richness that it gets and the, the way that they're using it so specifically as a storytelling device, it would, it would, it would just, it would be like a faded Polaroid snapshot from the 1970s. It just isn't the same thing. I actually said yes to the movie before I read the script. Uh, I'd known Joel and Ethan, you know, just casually over the last few years. Uh, and uh, somehow we always got set by each other at functions and stuff like that, you know. And it, it always seemed kind of like a natural. We always said, hey, it sure be great to do something one of these days. And, and uh, I, had, I got a call saying that they wanted me for their new movie. And uh, they said, well, they want to talk to you. And uh, I called them up and just said, yeah, I don't, I don't care what it's about. You know, I mean, I, I knew that it was going to be good. There, there's certain people that uh, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday. They said there's certain people that just don't suck, you know, and they don't suck and they, they never do. And so you, you can't go wrong. You imagine uh, one of these uh, film noir movies, you know, The Big Sleep or Double Indemnity or any of those movies with their sense of humor. And instead of a detective, I'm a barber. And it's just about the story of this barber who slowly but surely gets pulled into this web of intrigue. This is a 1949 movie. It's entertainment. And it's, uh, it's something to, to, to get a laugh out of, think a little bit about, you know, get into the characters and the story and watch like you're watching The Big Sleep, you know, or any other movie of that period. Only, hopefully, with uh, a little bit of a wink, you know? But I, I think people would love this movie. It was unlike anything I'd ever read. It was a, the central character is a great character. It's a wonderful uh, kind of anti-hero kind of thing. So I really enjoyed it, and I laughed a lot. His name is Big Dave, and he uh, own, uh, is... Well, he runs Nerdlinger's department store, and he's kind of a bit of a loudmouth clothes horse kind of guy. It's dark. It's very dark. The humor is, is still there, but I think it's a dark subject, and it's an odd, odd central character. I'm not sure what it's going to make it make a different I, from the other Cohen movies. I don't know how it's being shot, and I don't know what it's going to look like, but... Uh, it's a different subject matter entirely. It's really, I've never read anything like it. It's bizarre. 
Ethan and Joel had called me and they said that uh, they had this part of a barber that they wanted me to look at. And uh, uh, when I read it, I, I was uh, uh, so impressed by uh, all the twists and turns in it. It was uh, uh, totally different, I think. It was sort of a departure from uh, the last film. So uh, I immediately said uh, yes. I'd have to say that this is one of the best jobs uh, in show business, uh, working with the Coen brothers, uh, at least for me personally. Uh, their scripts are always uh, something different, something uh, innovative, something unique that uh, an actor uh, can really sink his teeth into. Uh, uh, the most uh, uh, easygoing set, uh, one of the most easygoing sets I've ever been on in terms of the way you work. Uh, uh, the, the attitude towards everyone on the set is so great, but uh, the material uh, gives actors an opportunity to really uh, go places where most of you don't have a chance to go in your uh, traditional movies. I play Freddie Riedenschneider, who's a, who's a, a, a defense lawyer. Um, he's, the, the, the movie takes place in, in Santa Rosa, California, 19, uh, 1949, Santa Rosa being a fairly small town, I guess, at that time. And um, there's, a, there's a murder, and there's no one locally that can handle this case, so they, they called to, uh, to the big city, to Sacramento, which is nearby, and uh, call on the guy who's, you know, sort of you, you, where you get the most bang for your buck. And, uh, and that's Freddie Reed and Schneider. It makes me long for black and white movies again. It's uh, it, it's a whole different way of uh, we've gotten so used to seeing things in color. Because I I grew up on black and white TV, and and there's a certain amount of um, sort of active participation that the viewer has. You have to fill in. You have to fill in, and uh, it it's it's a it's a slightly it's a slightly altered reality. There is a certain stillness to the piece. It's a very reflective piece, and you're trying to understand, you know, this this character who's actually quite complex, but you think is kind of just this sort of uh, cipher, but he's not. Um, you know, it goes back to the the whole thing. If you're holding a close up of somebody for that amount of screen time. It's, you know, it's got a, that image gets scrutinized a lot. It's not only, you know, it's, it's got to be good and it's got to be telling and it's got to be right for that moment in the film. And it's got to, it takes, it has to be more considered than just, you know, just a flashy, you know, image. Dennis is like great, one of the greats, isn't he? I mean, I, you know, I first worked with him on Barton Fink, which is the first time I worked with Joel and Ethan as well. And uh, um, what is it now with him, three or four? Yeah, he's just the, the best. I mean, we've become very much a, a team, you know, which is when really you can do your best work. I, th I think that's the thing. You, you, it cuts down the amount of communication you need because you know each other's way of working and their needs just technically, but also their sort of sensibilities and. You know, so it's, 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 it's interesting. It's all the way a number of individuals see something that all kind of coalesces into one vision. It's a, uh, it's a fascinating process, you know, and it's, it, yeah, it's fascinating. We started thinking about the movie, actually, because we have this piece of set dressing from, uh, I think it was in the Hudsucker Proxy, another movie we did. We shot a scene in a barber shop, and there was a poster on the wall of all the different period haircuts, 1940s haircuts, and we just were looking at that. It was like a fixture, and we appropriated it for our office, and we're looking at it, and I don't know. That's really where the story started. I know it <laughs> sounds a little bit odd, but that's actually the case. It, you know, it came from a haircut poster. The movie's about a barber in Northern California in the late 40s who um, um, doesn't really want to be a barber. And uh, what he wants to do is go into dry cleaning. <laughs> and he, uh, 
um, he discovers that his wife is having an affair with her employer. And in an attempt to become a dry cleaner, he sets a chain of events in motion that involve his wife and his wife's lover, which have tragic consequences for everyone involved. The whole Barbara thing is really just the backdrop. The story didn't sort of catch fire until we added the dry cleaning to the mix. And then we knew we had something that we could take and pitch to all the studios. It's black and white, as you mentioned before. That certainly sets it apart. Um, it's, um, yeah, actually, well, that's a big difference. Yeah. It's being black and white. It's something we've never done before. We've done a lot of movies with Roger Deakins, the director of photography. He's, uh, no, Roger's never done a, certainly not a black and white feature, although his background is in documentary stuff. Um, it's been, that part of it has been new and interesting. I mean, figuring out what things are going to look like, uh, which is often kind of tricky. Uh, what the sort of tonal values of things that you're obviously used to seeing in color are going to look like in black and white film has been all sort of new and a learning thing for us. So, you know, that's the most sort of notable respect in which it's unfamiliar. This movie is kind of an unfamiliar process for us. America is going to love Ed. America is, yeah, yeah. going to embrace Ed. It's going to be a yeah. craze. Ed yeah, is Billy no Bob's character. That. Ed yeah. is Ed. Ed yeah. is a very strong yeah. thing, especially yeah. in Billy Bob's hands. It's like dynamite. Ed. Yeah, we really um, didn't realize quite how potent a central character we had until Billy Bob... We, we say he brought him to life, but that's kind of oxymoronic in the case of this particular character. Um, because, as I said, he's... He's got a low metabolism. He's got a very low metabolism. But... Um, I really think he's, you know, it's a very, very strong characterization. We were actually thinking we should have like bumper stickers, speaking of marketing, that were said things like, be like Ed, or Ed is, that sort of thing. He's or our, Ed is Ed. Good morning. 15. 19, take one. Okay. Background action. <laughs> You guys are the only stationary things in the frame. So if you pace, it's gonna be harder to see you. Yeah, yeah. When uh, I don't like dinner, what do I say? Come on, come on. I say, Jesus, honey. Honey, brag again. Come on. Honey, <laughs> <laughs> brag again. <laughs> right, honey? <laughs> <clears throat> you in the service, Ed? No, oh, Dave, I wasn't. Ed was for Ed was for up on account of his fallen arches. Jeez, <laughs> oh, that's tough. That's, that's, that's tough. So we bust off the beach, and we find this kid, Arnie Bragg, missing on recon. Well, the Japs had eaten the son of a bitch. <laughs> if you'll pardon the, uh, well. Anyway, this was a scrawny, pimply kid, too. Nothing to write home about. I mean, I never would have, you know. <laughs> so what do I say, honey? So what do I say when I don't like dinner? Come on, what do I say? Come on. I say, Jesus, honey, honey, break again. <laughs> honey, break again. 
Sweet. Eat Charlie Dick too. Okay. Yeah, the Japs had us pinned down on Buna for something like six weeks. Speed. Two out of one. Mark. Back on action. And action. You know, so the problem was that what they brought with them was all these diseases, these explorers. Uh, ague, uh, diphtheria, uh, whooping cough. And, you know, the natives would come and they'd get all sick. But that's no problem of you. You don't have to worry about that, uh, Gary. Anyway, uh, cool.